let's put it like this. If you run the track that New York would like you to run, you could be dead by now. You know, as simple as that. I mean, there's a million things to do, but who's interested in doing a million things? Especially every day. I mean, it's enough to deal with one thought sometimes, all day, one thought, just to clear it up. It wasn't my intention, nor was it ever my intention to, to move to New York. I, I had a, a, a great appreciation of what was going on here um, from outside. I lived in uh, Northern California, and I played with a lot of musicians out there. Um, Charles Tyler, David Murray, and Frank Lowe, among the many. And when they all came back out here to New York, they, they called me and they said, you ought to come out here. Olu Dara's here, Lester Bowie's here. It'd be great if you'd be here because it would broaden the contrast of the landscape. And um, it took me a while, but I came out in 76 with no particular intentions except to play. And Frank said he had a tour to Europe and uh, he asked me if I would uh, go on it with him. And um, I did, and I didn't come back. I went and uh, I ended up staying in France for a while, and teaching in Holland and working in Belgium and a little in Italy and some in Germany. And but so I ended up staying between seventy six and eighty two. I pretty much made Europe my base. But I I came back to New York periodically to play with David and uh Frank Lowe in particular. I mean the seventies was a great that loft period was a great period. I mean um one, two, three, four, I can think of at least four musicians that had their own performance spaces. Uh, Joe Lee Wilson, Sam Rivers, Rashid Ali. Um, there was Enveron. Yeah, but I, in, in this period that I was there, uh, these, I think, and I'm, I'm leaving out. Charles Tyler had one up here on 17th Street. I forget the name of that place. There were, there were a lot of places run by, more or less run by the musicians. Then there was the Tin Palace down here on Bowery, 2nd Street, where everybody used to, you know, go and play late and where you could meet anybody. But it was the, 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 for me, one of the great things about the loft period were, were the energy orchestras. These were the orchestra, the ensembles put together like in a day. Um, uh, Ed Daniels had one at one point. Hamid Blewett, David, uh, Murray. A lot, a lot of different people would put, put together these ensembles. Frank Lowe, a lot of people. And um, where 10 or 15 or 20 people would get together and just blow, just play. They'd just come together. Whoever called them up would say, <coughs> it was a great period for energy. That's why they were called energy orchestras. And it was a great period for free music or free jazz. Um, but the most I think you could, you could expect to come out of that period with was a lesson. And you, everyone had to figure out that lesson for themselves. Now, I had been thinking about uh, uh, 
what you could do as a conductor long before that. But in that period, in that period, 75 to well after the so-called loft jazz made its way out, um, I learned what I wanted to learn because I knew there was a lesson in that. And that lesson was that you could conduct improvisation and that you could harness melody, you could harness uh, many, many things that are r related to the very definition of music. How does performance fit to that definition of your music? It has a lot to do with what I do because I perform all my music in real time. In other words, what I rehearse for three or four or five days is not what I perform. So performance is very much a part of what I do. I mean, it's an integral part to what I do. Performance is where things happen. Even for the few films I've done or, 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 or TV work I've done, I've tried to hype everyone up into this state where it's performance. Once this is, we're in it, it's performance. It has nothing to do with reading these notes on the page like that. It has something to do with bringing these notes to life and throwing these notes into the audience. But the prerequisite for that is first, the other musician has to be interested in working with you. So that if that person is interested in working with you, he has to be interested in understanding your, your point of view. So there has to be some levels of tolerance here. And um, if I ask you to play with me, I already like your sound. If I ask you to play with me, I already like your ideas. L giving, giving, giving the musicians freedom Within the, within the rule of the composition, not the rule of law or the rule of music, but the, within the rule of the composition. In time, you find the people. They show up. That's not, I don't think that's a problem. They show up. Good evening. And, uh, hey. and thank you for coming out because it looks like it's unanimous. Yes. And that is that all of you, including me, love my brother. Yeah! I'm going to relate two stories, and we're going to play for about 20 minutes, and then Henry Threadgill is going to come on, and he's got something very, very special. Um, I lost my protector. For all my life, Wilbur has protected me from many, many, many things. And one of the first stories in my life that I remember was that when Wilbur went in the Air Force, when I was about nine, he was about 19, I was riding through the park with my bike, and two guys jumped me and took my bike from me. And way across the park, I heard somebody say, that's Wilbur's brother! And they brought me my bike. <laughs> and uh, he's been like that with me all my life. And I'm sorry I had to tell so many people no, especially in the band or orchestral situation, because I wanted all bass, all basses, because the name of his publishing company was Mo Bass. So I'm trying to give him Mo Bass. I mean, uh, we're reading music, 
and we're reading it down and we didn't play it right the first time, I can go back to the top and do it again or to go here and do that. Or do it, I can, you can do that. But with something that's improvised, maybe. But that becomes part of the music. So I have this thing that's built up as memory one, okay? So I, I call memory one, boom, everybody goes to the same place. Boom, we start to build it up, we start to deconstruct, we start to pull things apart. And we get to a certain point and I say, oh no, we have to start this again. I go memory one, boom, back to the beginning. Da -da 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 build it up, build it up, build it up. Oh, well, let's build it again. Memory one, boom. And we take it and I say, we'll go this way with it this time. We'll take it this way. So I'm playing with the same idea. I can go back. But it's not, I can't clean anything up. That's done. And that's the great thing about it. Lawyers get frustrated, judges get frustrated, doctors get frustrated, street cleaners get frustrated. You don't think musicians get frustrated? Of course they do. I mean, everybody gets frustrated. Everybody, let's put it like this, everybody that takes their job seriously gets frustrated. If they take their job seriously, if they take life seriously, they get frustrated from time to time. But that doesn't mean they stop working. And it doesn't mean you don't go on. The thing is with me, and now I can go back to New York in the 70s. Just before, I went to Europe and stayed till 82, more or less. Like I said, I came back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Was that I realized this is great and everybody here is wonderful. What I'm learning in New York and what I'm learning in and, and other places in the world is really great and I can put all this stuff together because I don't have to live like that and I don't have to stand in the same lines that everybody else does because I'm, I, I, I refuse to. You know what I mean? Every Saturday you can go over there on 7th Street and stand in line and they'll give you a half a kilo of cheese, a half kilo of butter, a half kilo of, I mean, some bread. They'll give you the essentials. But you have to stand in line. You have to stand in line if it's below zero, or you have to, and you have to stand in line if it's 105 degrees to have these essentials for living, for waking up tomorrow. Some lines you stand in, some lines you don't. Some lines you don't have to stand in. <laughs> You know, sometimes you have your routine in the morning when you wake up. And sometimes you decide, well, this is my day. This is a free day. I'm just going to do it the way I want to. Look in your calendar. You have no appointments. You, And then you make your way through the day. You navigate through the day. And then that becomes, at the end of the day, that becomes your composition with or without a schedule. But I think the whole idea is to accomplish something every day and to accomplish something that can keep you ultimately fit in one way or another, psychologically, physically, socially, culturally. <laughs> 